Hello everyone, I'm Brian. Today I'm going to be doing Answering Comments Part 5. So I just finished reacting to the second part of Krishnamurti's video and all of a sudden after I was done with that I got a notification that it was just utterly blocked. So I mean it would have been fine if they just claimed it and took all the revenue from it. That would have been perfectly fine. But if it's just going to get blocked and me taking an hour to do the video and an hour to an hour to edit it. <laughs> I merely just put it in the editing machine after trimming out the beginning and end and uh, and then just posting it up there. But if it's just going to be blocked, I don't think I'm going to be doing any more reaction to Krishnamurti. It's just because if it gets blocked, then that's, that's a lot of my time away of doing things that I need to do. And, you know, again, like I said, it would have been perfectly fine if they just claimed it all. It, I mean, it's, it's, it is, in fact, their stuff. It's copyrighted for them. I'm glad they let me have some of them. Some of them they did just claim it. Some of, uh, and then some they did block. But I'm, I guess I'm just going to be done with that. So, all right. So I'm just going to do this part. I wanted to do this anyway. There's been a, a lot of comments. It's actually quite good. So um, a user said Maya is not exactly illusion. It's just what you can perceive through your senses and scientific exper uh, equipment experiment <laughs> equipment it's not the ultimate nature of the universe if you remember Swami's example of the golden bracelet a bracelet a bracelet is Maya apparent reality only the gold is the ultimate reality which would exist no matter whether the bracelet remains in that form or not hope this answers your questions about Maya yes uh, like I was exp I think I explained it there uh, my understanding of Maya which is makes sense to me is the fact that again we look at bracelet its form and function not necessarily what it's made out of so um, bracelet the form of it it's more than likely like a, a circle kind of deal and the function it's just a style they put on your wrist and then you wear it around a ring form and function it goes on goes around in your ring finger and that's the form circle the function style again hat the form of a hat is something circular it could be like many different kinds of hat. cowboy hat baseball cap football helmet which is kind of like a cap the 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 material that's made out of these things are all different but it but that's the that's the reason why um, I say form and function is because um, it's not what's made out of. It's not always the same thing, but Brahman is the same as throughout all of them. And that's the reason why I like to understand Maya as a misunderstanding. We think bracers as the actual object that it's made out of. It's a, it's a brace, a, a bracer, bracer, bracelet, sorry. But the, the material that's made out of it, which is what I, I understand is what he's trying to point at, is the fact that it is the con the consistent thing, consistent thing that's apparent in all objects, all things, which is Brahman, and I agree. Um, again, merely saying like this pen is form and function. I'm sh I have not really thought about. Um, using that as an everyday thing form and function when we say something form and function form and function form and function you know i'm sure there's a something that can break that but right now that's the best example i could give it's a for when we say something it's a form and function not what it's made out of all right let me look for the next question okay so this is a big one like a really big one i've only read the first paragraph out of this uh this um dictionary here <laughs> so let's see how much i can get this done okay so time um timeline for us is in three dimensions is dharma is immutable because as you said it is a paradox where you cannot change the past without destroying your own future and because of the desire to reset and do things differently is why the concept of rebirth exists so you start all over again and do it better than your previous life. <clears throat> it is exactly that. You are totally starting off on a new timeline. You don't necessarily need to go back and change anything. You can start off on a new clean slate, a different set of parents, a totally different area, location, planet, galaxies, who knows. You don't have to go back and redo it again. That would be a waste of time, time and futile anyways. You are trying to become perfect by going backwards. Who said you cannot become perfect by going forwards? That is why you have, uh, I'm sorry, 
that is why you have rebirth in the first place, starting off anew without the baggage of the past to fix as much your uh, as much of your bad karma as possible. That's just the first paragraph. There's a lot more paragraphs there. Let me just do that one first, and and then I'll see about the rest of them. So, the thing is, though, is that you're not starting off in a clean slate. You have already baggage with you, which is your past karma. If you have bad bad karma, you will be starting off in a worse position already. So I don't know if that's what starting off in a clean slate is, though. You know, is is it? Is it legitimately a clean slate? Does, doesn't your karma supposed to follow you? That doesn't mean you cannot change your karma. It's just more along the lines that you don't, you don't, you do good to erase your bad karma, but your karma always follows you, whether it be bad or good. So I don't. Is it right to say that you're starting off in a clean slate? Uh, starting off without baggage from your past. Well, karma is something from your past which follows you, so therefore it cannot be a clean slate. And it cannot be without baggage, because that karma is the baggage, that karma is the slate that you're starting off with, I think, if I understand karma correctly. I'm not sure. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong on that one. Um, I think that's all I have to say for that one. So let me know about that one. I'm going to read the rest of your comments and to see which one I need to pick because you wrote literally a, uh, a novel there and I want to uh, pick out the good ones. I'll be right back. Alright, so continuation of this uh, novel that he wrote. Um, when, I, um, when I say predetermined, you would go like, but there is no free will. Yes, there is free will, but it's highly limited. Limited by whom? By ourselves. We are Atmos, approximate to soul in English. Who are eternal, immortal, not created by God. Death is for the body, not for the Atma. And the way the spelling of Atma is A-A-T-M-A. -A -A. Yes, okay. Uh, the Atma started off by entering into creation of God by its own volition. The entering of the Atma into creation is itself a karmic action. Each Atma in the universe has its own intrinsic character character which defines the nature and path it will take. This intrinsic nature of the Atma is what initiates the first set of karmic actions. God has, hasn't determined our destiny so to speak. Rather it has formulated a set of rules, laws that trigger with the karma that you do. Basically Newton's third law. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction except that reaction, reaction happens in a cosmic timeline because not every action karma that you do must have an immediate equal and opposite reaction like in the terms of motion. <clears throat> this is your life we are speaking of which goes through multiple cycles of birth, uh, birth and death. The karmic reactions are spread out over multiple lifetimes so as to not overwhelm the Atma. So uh, it's a little hard to say that we we have free will if everything is predetermined. Um, I don't think your previous uh, two paragraphs states anything about... Oh, you do say that. The adjourn is just a tool for execution what was already predetermined. That's one of the statements you said with, with predetermined in there. Um, so... I mean, if things are predetermined, then there is no free will. Now, unless you do, unless you're saying that we are exempt from that predeterminism, then everything else is predetermined. Then, then perhaps maybe, but we either have free will or we don't. Although, even though I choose to believe that we're in somewhere in the middle too, where we do have predeterminism and free will. Because there can be an argument for that we are all predeterministic based on our past. And, um, and the argument for that, which makes sense to me, is, um, is because of the things we experience in our past will determine our future. If you want to eat ice cream, um, it's because you've eaten ice cream before. Um, you've someone said that ice cream is good and then you tried it and then now you love ice cream I can see it working that everything's predetermined um, it's kind of 
is I went through this phrase about finding out about free will versus determina- uh, determination. I, I don't know if that's the right word for that. And the the conclusion that someone came up with is that we're a little bit of both, which would agree with you here. But if there's something out there that... Again, I, I guess I can't really argue against you because I'm pretty much <laughs> agreements with you. That's what I want to agree with. I can see the argument for for predetermination, though. But anyways, the next thing I want to talk about, sorry. I, I, I'm just saying I'm going to agree with you with the predetermination part, that we do have s- some free will and there are certain things that we are predetermined to do because of our past habits, which flows into karma pretty well <laughs> but anyways um the next one in that same paragraph you wrote is the the karmic reaction is spread out over multiple lifetimes as not to overwhelm the atman so are we so are we forever to be reborn into this world never ever to be liberated and if that's the case then that makes sense of what you just stated there that the karmic reactions are spread throughout over multiple lifetimes. But if we are to be liberated, capable of being liberated, so how can that karmic reaction spread over multiple lifetimes if there's a predetermined amount of, well, I wouldn't say a predetermined amount of uh, lifetime to reborn, but what happens if you get reborn after this lifetime? What about your the past karmic actions that potentially have spread further out from um, this life? So, like you said, it's, it's spread over a longer period of time so that you're not overwhelmed with bad karma or good karma. And what happens if there's, like, bad karma still left over, you know, carry the one bad karma, and but you've come to um, Muksha, I believe it was, or realize self-realization, where you uh, are liberated. What happens to the leftover bad karma, or does it always play out to be your bad karma will end at the at the the birth of your realization life? So when you're born, all the bad karma that's left over will be there, and then you'll have self-realization when you die, or somewhere in there, and then you die and no longer be reborn. But I don't know if you believe in, um, I don't know if you believe in, I believe it's moksha, basically where you, you stop being reborn. So let me continue reading the next few paragraphs to see which one I want to include. I'll be right back. Okay, so to kind of finish out this comment here, it says, um, the interesting thing you said on, uh, on the last page of your book, <laughs> um, is that, um, You said that uh, the karmic time scale are the level of cosmic scales. As long as creation exists, your karmic ledger will keep accumulating both good and bad karma. The good karma will never cancel out the bad karma. It is two separate columns in the ledger, just like your bank account, bank sh- balance sheet. I would say that's probably a bad example because so long as you keep putting money in there, no matter how much money you take out, you're still always being a positive because the positive will cancel out the negative. So not a good example, but I get what you're saying. I, I think going back to the ledger, having good and bad karma, good enough example, honestly. Um, so you will go through the karmic reaction, maybe in the same lifetime or different lifetime, but the reaction will happen. Uh, so basically you're saying about um, basically killing animals for food. You you did it out of uh, necessity for your own survival. The animal suffered and that will incur in your bad karma. I mean, and it's interesting that I don't, I don't know how karma exactly works. I assumed it was more good versus bad. Um, but you're saying that karma itself, you have good accumulation and bad accumulation of karma and they don't cancel each other out. So how much good, like... At that point, it goes to the point of how much good karma do you need to... Or what's the point of having good and bad karma? Um, 
Yeah, what's the point of having good and bad karma if they don't cancel each other out? Your bad, you will always be punished for your bad karma. How does that work in reincarnation? It's, it's, there's a lot of questions when you think about it that way, though, because when that, the way I've always assumed it is the fact that based on your accumulated karma, your negative would subtract your karma and your positive would add to your karma will determine where you get reincarnated in life. If you Like you said about the different layers of... Um, different layers of um, dimensions but when you go to the fourth and higher dimensions God exists in the highest dimensions you can think of so basically there are multiple dimensions that you can achieve the more good karma you accumulate the higher you go but the more bad karma you accumulate the lower karma you go but uh, that, that then it's still again it's kind of confusing to say okay if you how much karma do you need to accumulate to go up higher dimensions but uh, but thing is though is that your bad karma doesn't bring you back down because they make things complicated if you separate the columns out like that. Can you accumulate so much good karma in one life and bad karma to level up and still suffer for it? It doesn't make sense that way. Even if they're spread throughout your entire life, you eventually level up because of the amount of karma you accumulate. But as you level up, you're still being punished for your bad karma, but how can you level up if you're being punished? I would, my, the, the easiest, simplest, I guess the simplest way is to do a, a simple single scale of good and bad karma, whether you end up with more good than bad, will determine how high amount of karma you've accumulated. you done all good, you keep going up in karma, you do bad, your karma drops. It's like a credit score, basic. Credit score would... Credit score would be a good example, or a bank balance actually would be a good example of um, good and bad karma, because you're, you're, you, there's no two separate bank balances. There's not how much debt you had and you have to pay back, and how much money you have. If you have, uh, if you take money from your bank, you're removing your good karma. If you put money in your bank, you're adding good karma. So removing money, bad karma, your your good karma drops. As you add money to your bank, good karma accumulates. You know, it just goes up and down. So uh, a bank, um, a bank sheet would be a little bit better to talk about if there's only one scale. The two scale one, you have to explain that a bit more. That doesn't quite make too much sense. I get it, but I, the the going up and down of levels doesn't make much sense with the two level thing. You, have to, you definitely have to uh, explain that a bit for me. And I like your explanation about chess. You're saying at the very beginning you have unlimited moves, um, but in reality there are very few moves throughout the entirety of chess. Like I said, higher level chess. There's, there's plenty of moves but the first move determines everything about the game, I think. I don't know. I don't play chess professionally. I love chess. I did play chess. I was decent at chess. Um, but, and I like the the analogy you have there. So, what you said is, uh, so, okay, think of karma as chess, which is also invented in India, by the way. The outcome of the game is determined by the first set of moves you make. Yes, your free will at the beginning of the game will slowly decrease as you make more and more moves. As your opponent also makes uh, makes moves to counter yours. Eventually, it will come to a point to where you are restricted from making more moves, and one or or one of the two will be in decides, uh, decided a winner. Um, karma is the same thing. The creation of the chess board, the humans are the players. Uh, karma is the game moves, death is the opponent, time is the chess clock. In the karmic cycle, the number of games you take part in. Which is very, that's actually really cool. <laughs> cool explanation there. Um, after the end of each game, you reset the position, rebirth, and play based on your past experience. Because you do not carry over knowledge of your past life. If you did, you'd be quickly depressed looking at the uh, gargantuan amount of mistakes you did. The mistakes in your single lifetime when you look back. You wish you never did. It makes you cringe, feel sad, depressed, anxious. 
Imagine having the knowledge of all your past lives. You'd completely lose interest and continue the game with anyone. I'm sorry, I would think differently than that. I think that's... Uh, this is, goes to, I guess, what people... People who do not learn from the mistakes will feel that way. Absolutely. I try to learn from my mistakes. So the more I... And I have this idea that you learn more from losing or doing something wrong than you do by getting it right. So when you lose, you learn certain moves or certain mistakes that you can do better the next time you try. So that's my outlook of life. Learning about all my mistakes in the past is, if I can, that'd be great. I would know what to do in the future. But, it, and there's another saying about if we don't learn about our past, we have a tendency to repeat it which is a bad thing um people who date for example if they date a certain kind of guy and they're abusive or a certain kind of woman and they're abusive and then they break up and then all of a sudden they, they date another person and they start to see these same things but they continue to date and these people become abusive and they get out of that relationship they go back into another relationship in which they see the same exact things as the past two relationships they continue to cycle until they learn their lessons until they realize hey look i need to stop making this mistake so to remember things of the past to remember your mistakes you become you hopefully you become a better person after that but if you don't remember your past you don't remember your history you don't remember the mistakes you made, you will bound, you are bound to repeat those mistakes. So I don't know if that's a good way to think about that one. Um, let's see, um, you completely lose interest and continue to game anymore, which is which is why power of Trikala, three Kalas, or time Gyana. I'm sorry, Gyan. I think G Y A A N knowledge, knowledge of past, present, and future was only acquired by those yogis who had reached near self perfection. They had the emotional, mental, and physical stability to handle the enormous knowledge of all their past, present, and future. That's interesting. Um, and now I will say this: imagining having knowledge of all your past lives. I will say. If you've never had the knowledge of all your past lives, that all of a sudden you had all that knowledge, that is way too much to handle for one person. But if you have this accumulative knowledge as you progress through their lives, it all comes in one right after another. It's kind of like, again, like how you live life now. You have the accumulation all of all the knowledge that you've had while you're growing up. It's all easy. But imagine you were just born just now and then you have all this information that you learn from the past. It'll be overwhelming. So uh, a gradual, gradually learning these things is a good thing. Learning from your past, in my opinion, is a good thing. If you don't learn from your past, you repeat. You have a tendency to repeat the past. So I'm not too sure about that one. Um, I don't don't get me wrong. Yeah, you'll cringe. You'll be you'll cringe about thinking about some of the things you did in the past, but at the least by knowing about it, you know not to repeat that. Um, feel sad, depressed, and anxious? Yes, if, if you, when you think about it again, you'll probably feel those emotions, but you, at least you know not to do those again. I would say that. And I hope I answered it good enough, and I hope you can answer me the questions I've asked. Now let me go find another one. Okay, so the next one is, he has seen so many videos, then he, also he is stubborn, calling himself atheist, don't believe in God, reincarnations, and many other things. He is his own pre-notion world, which is not letting him open. Well, I won't say I'm, it's not letting me open. So, um, yes, I call myself atheist. I do not believe there is a higher power out there. Uh, do I, do I uh, believe in God or reincarnation? No, not in the same sense. Um, do I believe if if I were to believe that we are Brahman, that God is Brahman and we are Brahman, that we are God, everything's God, God is everything, then I can believe in that. Um, reincarnation, the only way I believe in reincarnation is the sheer fact that the materials in this body 
gets reused and other things. So eventually, obviously, every seven about every seven years, our the entirety of our body gets replaced, and that in a sense gets reused in life. Um, it's not that I'm not open. It's that the fact that I must experience it or have a good enough, mostly a good enough argument for it. I'm completely against merely believing in something for the sake of believing in it. Um, so I, that's, and that can be seen as not being open, which in my personal opinion should be a good thing. I think you should not just believe in anything. And that's what a lot of things that I've heard in Hinduism say is that in Hinduism, you don't, they don't want you to believe. They want you to experience. I 100% completely agree with that. You must experience it. You must know it. You must obtain the knowledge. Don't believe in it. Don't believe in it just because someone smart or wise has said it. Experience it. Do it. Make sure you believe in that. Do not just believe in it because someone said it. So that's and that resistance that a lot of people see in me because of that think that I'm not open, but it's not. That's not the case. I am open. That's why I'm watching these videos. I'm listening, but the things that people want me to accept seems like I'm not open to it but it's it's hard to believe that nothing in my experience has nothing that I've experienced relates to what they're talking about it doesn't fit into the materialistic worldview again it's not that I'm not open it's that I must I must ensure that I believe in it I will not believe in something for the sake of believing in it I hope that answers your question Okay, so here's an interesting one. Um, you are being confused by the terms brain and mind. Um, you're talking about brain at 10.30, which is Swami Q&A, April 7, 2019, React Part 1. Um, that you lose some parts of the brain, it will still work. Brain is physical, whereas mind is the metaphysical. You cannot touch it, it is the intelligence intelligent because which of which everything is working in the body includes including the brain you can say brain is processor whereas the mind is the operating system or software so this is kind of I read this one and um, let's see okay so we can look at say um, the brain I thought about this a little bit brain um, think the brain is the CPU as you say CPU right we can look at the RAM which is a short term memory um, the hard drive which is the long term memory and we have the IOs input outputs just like keyboard, keyboard and all of that, which is again our our in, even our own IOs, which is our eyes, our um, hands, and all of that. Um, software, right? So what's the equivalent to the software? Software, which would be you say the mind, which I wouldn't disagree with you on that one. to a degree but the thing is though is that I think in, in maybe my teachings the brain and the mind I would say that the mind the mind itself is also a um, in my opinion uh, is the um, electric electrical yeah electrical signals which also of course is equal to the software now this one I, I've thought about this a little bit I should, should have probably thought about it a little bit more but anyway so um, you said that the the mind makes the body work and the brain is just a CPU um, let's see that if you lose some parts of the brain, it will still not work. Brain is physical, whereas the mind is metaphysical. You cannot touch it. It's intelligent because that which of everything works in the body includes the brain. 
brain is the processor, where is the mind is the operating system, operating system or software. Hmm. Which I do agree with you. If cert, and the, I think I think actually now that I remember now, the brain is a little bit of everything here in a sense. Because the brain, I would say, uh, brain would be the um, CPU, the hard drive, the RAM, the also the uh, software, and um, that's about it. And this is, I guess, this is this is actually what I was thinking of. So your brain does the process, and the, and the reason why we have all this is because we understand that um, obviously we have long-term memory, long-term memory, long in. Uh, let me erase that. I'm going to run out of room here. Um, so long and short-term memory. Make sure memory which is all part of the brain, which is, again, you know, your hard drive and your RAM. Also, the software is stored in the hard drive, strangely enough. So, and the processing powers in the brain, I do agree with you there. And um, the problem is, is the fact that the brain has these different sections. This is all part of the brain but these are all in different parts of the brain. So what you can do is you can say that we can break down the brain into like a front, right, left, um, somewhere in the center, center middle, and then the front deals with say CPU, the right, deals with the left portion of your body, the left portion deals with the right portion of your body, the center deals with, uh, there's there's a whole bunch of things in the center like your, your temp, your um, emotions, I believe. Um, what else? Center middle, might be actually center middle maybe where that's at. Um, actually, I think the front also has your emotions. Probably the front has your emotion because I think actually right here. Somewhere in the front is your emotions actually because of lobotomy. I believe whenever um, people get lobotomized they become in a sense emotionless. So we can say uh, front center actually for that one probably. Front center equals emotion again this is something that I, I, I again I, I do believe it to be true because I've, I've, w I've w <laughs> I didn't say I did research anything on it but I did watch um, people the, the lobotomy cases basically whenever they get lobotomized they they change as a person even though the, the CPU is still there the person is still there in a sense it's not the same person the emotions are gone it is a person that's there but the characteristics of that person is gone. So the brain is the thing that I wanted to get to is the fact that we do have a brain, but we're, we're oversimplifying the, the brain as just one big thing. When the brain has different parts, they have the front center, which is again, the reason why they have lobotomy, your emotions gets destroyed when that portion of the brain is gone. Um, then the CPU, is basically what um, I think a, a lot of people are saying is the is the Atman and the reason why the CPU is the Atman for me is because the CPU doesn't have any um, does not contain the hard drive or the RAM which is the long-term and short-term memory so the CPU itself is pure. Oop, what the heck was that? <laughs> the CPU. Let me let me erase that. That was I never done that before. Okay. So, anyways, the CPU is um, is unaffected by the your long term memory or in your short term memory. It's completely it just processes things. 
whenever a thought comes in there, it does the process and it kicks it right back out. And this is the thing that I think we just haven't discovered yet. We don't know where the CPU is at in the brain. We know storage, our brain is practically a huge storage. We know that the brain has long-term and short-term storage. And the brain also has all these, you know, it has the control center if you're, when you go pee, poo, breathe, um, a lot of other things I just can't think of. And they're all part of certain parts of the brain. So we, in terms of the brain, we've, we've, we know a lot of things about it, not, but not everything. Until we know everything of the brain, it's kind of hard to say that the CPU or the Atman, we don't know where that's at. Now, I know Swami, a lot of people believe that the Atman is something separate from the body, or the brain and everything. It's the observer of all of this. And right now, I don't have any evidence or experience on that. Now, people could personally experience that, but I just don't personally, me, myself, I don't know. Um, I may have experienced this blankness, but that doesn't prove to me that it's separate from the body because I'm, it just, it's not that I'm like, oh, I'm, oh, I experienced it and I want to deny it. No, it's more along the lines, I experience it, but I don't see that separation. And that's the thing. Again, it's not like I'm, I'm like the last comment where, um, like I'm, I'm being stubborn or anything. I mean, I guess it might be. If it is, it is, you know. But it's not, I, ju I don't just merely believe just because it's convenient or it makes me likable or anything. I, I want a good reason and it has to make sense for me to believe. It doesn't have to be 100% right, but it has. there has to be enough behind it to where it's like, okay, it, it makes sense. I believe, like, I, I have no proof of Brahman. I don't, ha I don't have any proof that the, the most... My the, the tiniest of cells, which is composed of every the fabric of existence, is Brahman. I have no proof of that, but in my mind, I can see that making sense, and I can believe that because again, so, the, the technology is not there yet to to whittle us down to the very fine existence of what creates this thing. I mean, we know it's plastic, but we can go down further than plastic. Then we can go down to atoms. We can nucleus protons neutrons electrons and something else that's as far as i got with my science class <laughs> you know and i'm sure we can keep going down until to the very last thing which uh advaita vedanta says is brahman according to swami sarvapiananda where brahman is the fabric of existence which to me would be some type of atom or something small that is everything is created out of so that even though I have no proof of that, that is something that I can believe. Until I until something else makes better sense than that, you know, that's what I choose to believe. And that's the reason why I'm and with here with the brain and the CPU, um, is that the I believe that the CPU, the Atman, is in the brain. Because nothing in my opinion and my experience um, has said otherwise and also because everyone in the world well not everyone in the world um, let me say that um, majority of people think that they are the brain that it makes sense so far everything in the world that I think we've experienced is materialistic so it makes sense that the Atman or the CPU is in our brain right now I'm not, and again, I'm not, I, I completely believe in Brahman being the fabric of existence. Until something comes up better that explains existence, that right now makes the absolute most sense to me. And the, the thing that absolutely makes the most sense to me about Atman, the CPU, is in the brain. Until something else comes up that better, that to me makes the better sense. So this looks confusing now that I look at it again, but uh, this to me makes the most sense. Again, you were using computers, and I was thinking about it earlier when I read your comment, and uh, and I wanted to kind of go through this. 
but yeah, brain CPU, RAM, short-term memory. It's very something that everyone can kind of relate to, if you, especially if you build computers. Um, and the mind is software, but I look at that as electrical signals, because in our mind, there's obviously electrical signals going back and forth. And I'm wondering if that may be the software. Um, because again, software is stored in RAM or, or hard drive and RAM, actually. <laughs> um, but yeah. I think I said enough on this one. So let me pause and find another one. All right, just to get this video out there, it looks like it ran for very long. I'll look through some more comments. There's a long list of comments, and my gosh, I'm at least trying to read them all, and I'm at least trying to give you guys a thumbs up and a heart just to let you know that I read it. But sometimes I miss things, sometimes I get put for held for review, and um, hopefully I want to do this again because this is really great. I hope that people like me doing this, you know. Um, answering your comments and stuff because it's, it's very cool very interactive although you know it'd be nice to do it live but um time and f not time, well, time mostly anyways that's answering comments part five i hope you like it if you like my content please consider subscribing thumbs up thumbs down down below thanks for watching see you in the next vid